Hello and welcome once again to Sustainable Tourism by David Weaver, Relational Summary Lectures by Dr. T. H. Culhane. That's me. This week we're looking at Chapter 5, The Facilitating Sectors, and it includes such topics as travel agencies, sustainability initiatives, European experiences, specialized merchandise guidebooks, outbound tour operators, implications for sustainability, sustainability-related sentiments and practices, tour operators initiatives for sustainable tourism development, transportation providers, airlines, airport issues, industry best practice examples like American Airlines and British Airways, cruise ships, expenditure monopolization, a globalized phenomenon, evidence of poor environmental performance, sustainability initiatives, hospitality providers, major influence on destination and tourism sustainability, pioneering sustainable tourism, and on the ground section, implementing sustainability at Grecotel. So here we are, chapter five, the facilitating sectors. Now, one of my more exciting jobs in college, far better than feeding and taking care of leeches in the electrophysiology lab at Harvard, or feeding my fellow students by flipping burgers at the campus grill, was working for the Harvard travel guide, Let's Go Tunisia. I got hired because I met one of their editors while engaged in an educational tourism summer program at the Bourguiba Institute in Tunis, and he had just gotten back to the city and was exhausted and fed up with out in the boondocks. He found that I was willing to go way off the beaten path and find safe hostels for budget-conscious student travelers where one could engage in adventure tourism like traveling through the night on third-class trains and crowded buses and donkey carts to the remote sand dunes of the Sahara, sleeping in homestays through sandstorms, and attending local wedding parties, discovering and evaluating the recently opened to the public underground Luke Skywalker hostels of Matmata, featured as Tatooine in Star Wars, horseback riding through the mountains and scuba diving in the cold waters of the Mediterranean. What the guidebook wanted was not just recommendations, but personal affidavits from people who actually did these things. First-person testimonials of adventures from your friendly explorer tour guide. Now, this was in 1982, and we were trying to put Tunisia on the map for educational tourists like me and you. I was doing a summer intensive Arabic course and studying French, and there were just enough of us non-Tunisians descending on that country each year that the country was banking on tourism as a revenue generator, but didn't yet have the infrastructure to attract people to areas beyond the narrow strip of beach at Bizert, where the big hotels were being built for French sun seekers to engage in nude sunbathing, while Tunisian guards beat back gawking locals who crowded each day along the barbed wire-topped fences surrounding the resort. University published guidebooks like the one I wrote for, Let's Go, were an invitation to alternative tourists that were and are, quote, especially significant, like travel agencies, for their influence on destination image, destination selection, and tourist behavior, says Weaver on page 75. Today, Weaver says, quote, green guidebooks are already a well-established component of alternative tourism. But, he says, sustainability-related sensitivities have yet to significantly infiltrate the conventional guidebook market, end quote. In other words, it may still be the case that most consumers would rather jet ski and hang out on the beach with the topless bathers during the day and drink heavily while doing the Danse des Canards in the disco at night, <laughs> served by Muslim waiters who can't drink or mingle but can at least engage vicariously in the culturally taboo actions in the foreign-dominated pleasure periphery of the coastal tourist environment. Note, though, that from the post-colonialist perspective, one of the selling points of going to many resorts in exotic Arabian or Muslim nations is precisely that you get to indulge in some of the guilty pleasures of the taboo, watching topless bathers or belly dancers or drinking booze or gambling, were only forbidden if you were actually a Tunisian in the resorts that I covered for the tour guide. Foreigners are allowed to follow a different code of ethics in the age of tourism imperialism, and tour operators are eager to use whatever special enclave status they can sell regarding hedonistic pleasures, displaying a remarkable amount of cultural insensitivity, as though the resort were some never-never land that was wholly disconnected from the culture in which it were situated. Resorts like Hedonism and Club Med are notorious in this regard. Still, niche guidebooks and internet sites for sustainability-minded and culturally sensitive tourists are now apparently beginning to have an impact on the industry, particularly by creating what Weaver on page 75 calls disintermediation. In 2016, 
there are a lot more resources like the Let's Go Guides that we were creating at Harvard back in 1982 to cater to adventurous tourists like me who don't have much of a stomach for packaged experiences or agencies trying to make a buck off of us rather than letting us spend the money supporting the local economy of the places we visit. Travel agencies and other outbound tour operators who don't add value in a world where you can cut out the middleman and make your own arrangements must increasingly find ways to capture and retain a dwindling market share. But unfortunately, many are using a high-pitched sales technique that sounds increasingly like a sideshow snake oil salesman preying on our excesses. For example, I recently received a random call asking me to take a robotic survey asking how green my preferences were when traveling. A pleasant surprise. I thought, wow, and they don't even know that I teach this stuff. How cool that tourism marketing has so incorporated the sustainability angle that they lead with that. So after I'd answered the questions, a human operator came on the phone and told me I had won a two-night, three-day cruise to the Bahamas for two. And all I had to do was pay the $118 port taxes and about $50 in gratuities. But when I went to accept the offer, the hard sell began, with each salesman whose pitch I declined passing me on to a manager with a better offer. They wanted me to sign on for extended stays in resorts in the outgoing port of Fort Lauderdale, in the Bahamas, and upon return in Orlando and Universal and downtown Disney. They were quite aggressive about it, and each time I politely declined, they put me on hold for long periods of time, saying they were gonna process my initial offer, exposing me to all sorts of advertisements of other tour packages that I could purchase, and then they'd put me on with another manager who would engage in a kind of psychological shaming asking me why I thought I was unwilling to take on this spectacular offer, which was a steal. They told me my reservation number had won me an unprecedented deal on an extended stay for $1,500 that would normally cost more than $3,000, and it would be unimaginable to give it up given the huge perks. The biggest selling point they had to offer, which they described as though it was the most exciting part of the whole trip they proposed, was an upgraded luxury cabin that your girlfriend will appreciate, and the exciting nightlife and the $50 and $100 gambling vouchers, $100 in free gasoline for a reduced rate rental car offer with a car that would conveniently meet me at the boat, and vouchers for alcoholic drinks, which are not included in the usual package. I kept trying to explain that I wasn't interested in drinking and gambling and partying in nightclubs or exclusive beaches, and when they asked me what I was interested in from the attractions they offered, I said, well, it's the Bahamas. You know, the coral reefs, the snorkeling, the scuba diving. Even the swimming with dolphins would interest me. The wildlife, the hiking, you know, sustainability and the green components that you drew me in with in the first place. That seemed to flummox them, and they repeated the allure of gambling vouchers and other activities that have nothing to do with the natural assets of the Bahamas, but could be done anywhere. From the confident voices of the young men and women they put on to try and wear my refusal down, it was clear they were trying to make some personal connection with me but they couldn't quite figure out how to relate to somebody who really does want his trips to reflect stewardship of the environment and appreciation for foreign cultures. They're too used to connecting with people intent on sunlust and other kinds of lust, who want convenience and exclusiveness and luxury, not people who like to mingle with the local culture and walk or ride bikes or public transit. I said to them, look, I don't get it. You lured me into this with a robot voice, giving me a survey of my green travel preferences, but you're not offering me anything that's green. What's up with that? Weaver notes in the book, quote, travel agencies are currently faced with the challenge of disintermediation, which is defined as the removal of intermediates such as travel agents from the product consumer connection. This is primarily a consequence of internet technologies that allow the consumer to communicate and make bookings directly with tour operators, carriers, car rental agencies, and hotels without the interventions of brokers. Now, that's what we were doing when we created the Let's Go Guide years before there was the internet. But now, it's become hyper-useful. Travel agencies, says Weaver, are responding to the threat of disintermediation by restructuring the services that they offer. Many travel agencies are capitalizing on the tradition of face-to-face -face contact as an opportunity to work in a highly personalized way with clients on more complex, specialized purchases, such as extended long-haul vacations. Page 75. And that would be great if they knew how to personalize a sustainable tourism experience. Weaver suggests that in time, they will be able to pay attention, quote, to sustainability-related issues and concerns that, quote, can be included as a value-added component 
and that we cultural creatives with higher levels of education are a promising market for this reinvented travel agency and one that is likely to be receptive to the sustainability add-on, end quote. But that's just the problem. It seems like a mere add-on rather than the point of the travel. Like the swimming with the dolphins activity that, tour, that the tour salesman casually threw in when trying to sell me on an extended stay in the Bahamas. He seemed to have no clue about the problematic of keeping cetaceans captive so tourists can pet them. No concept whether or not the diving he offered is done with buoy ties rather than reef destructive anchors. Couldn't answer anything about green products or practices used on the boat or at the destination. I told him I wanted to go on the cruise so I could investigate those very things. Now, perhaps if he'd been prepared for a dialogue about indicators and certificates, I would have been persuaded by the upsell. But at least this particular tour agency, one of the biggest, isn't there yet. Weaver corroborates this, saying on page 76, quote, the literature in general is highly critical of tour operators. The sector is described as an oligarchy dominated by a small number of large transnational corporations that use their clout to negotiate the lowest possible prices from inbound operators and other suppliers. Revenues for destination-based businesses as a result are reduced, forcing cost cuts that may translate into inadequate wages for local employees, neglect of the environment, and other sustainability-related problems. Even if they are inclined to identify or rectify these problems, outboard Outbound tour operators cannot easily act on these inclinations because of the spatial and functional disconnect between their own operations and the destination locales to which their clients are sent. That quote points out one of the huge differences between what we did at the Let's Go Guide at Harvard and what other agencies do today. Let's Go sent us out to experience alternative tourist destinations and attractions and to write about them and rate them and advise people and, yes, guide them. One would hope in this day and age, tour operators would at least be well trained in the theory and practice of the business as it confronts the dilemmas of development and population pressures, and that they would be conversant with clients who appreciate sustainable tourism. But when I asked the salespeople about how the cruise ship could help rejuvenate the location and avoid creating the, quote, destination life cycle crises of stagnation and decline that Butler describes with his S-curve model, nobody knew what I was talking about. It isn't that they didn't know about the S-curve model that you and I are studying. It's that they had no idea that the cruise ship they were sending me on had any impact at all and couldn't tell me why my dollars with them would help the company observe any principles at all, much less the Bellagio principles. The irony is that they might have been able to sell me if they'd used the word luxury in a different sense. Weaver says, quote, the inclination to act responsibly is constrained by exceedingly low profit margins, which encourages a high volume of customer turnover and relegates sustainability to a luxury that they cannot afford to pursue in the short term. Outbound operators, he says, will therefore be far more sensitive to customer complaints about value for money and service quality, meaning bad food or uncomfortable accommodations, than to any complaints about labor exploitation or environmental degradation. Although the psychocentric nature of the stereotypical mass package tourist makes it questionable whether such issues would even be flagged at a noticeable level in the first place, page 76. Now, I'm an allocentric tourist, according to the book, not a psychocentric. I like going out of the box. What's sad is that when the manager came on in disbelief to hard sell me more and more and asked me what I wanted in a tour, he had no clue what the allocentric tourist wants. He said, we obviously want your business to stay with us and not go to any of our competitors. So here's what I'm going to do for you. And then he started talking again about upgrading me to a luxury suite. If he had, could have gotten his marketing mind around the idea that sustainability, unfortunately, is a luxury, as Weaver tells us, he might have said, hey, I can give you an exclusive stay in the most sustainable cabin or destination lodge. All LED lights, completely solar powered, a place with composting toilets where you can do sea turtle protection activities. Hey, don't laugh. I stayed in exactly such places on islands and coastal areas in Borneo in the late 1990s. And the textbook uses as its case study on page 89 the on-the-ground practices of Grecotel resort hotels in Greece where, quote, they participate actively in the IHEI, work closely with the Greek Sea Turtle Protection Society to protect nesting beach habitat, and collaborate with local municipalities in a variety of community and environmental projects. 
They have standardized green practices, including the harnessing of solar power to heat water and the use of low energy light bulbs, double glazed windows, light sensors that turn off lights when nobody's around, the diversion of gray water for garden irrigation and the use of biological wastewater treatment plants with landscaping that uses native and endemic plants and architecture that celebrates traditional styles. Now that is luxury in my book and in this book. So if sustainability is relegated to being a luxury, then mass tourism operators should make that a positive selling point. That would then increase incentives for other operators to make such offers until it became eventually standard practice. Unfortunately, as Weaver admits, quote, the bulk packages marketed by large outbound tour operators tend to be undifferentiated generic products for example, one week at a beach resort, that appeal to the lowest market common denominator, foster homogeneity, and send tourists to already overcrowded honeypot destinations. Ultimately, because they possess few fixed assets outside of the origin regions where they are based. And it is very easy for footloose outbound operators to abandon a destination that becomes too socially, politically, or environmentally unstable. Hence, they are less likely to be greatly concerned about the implications of life cycle dynamics for particular destinations or be swayed by the in situ consumption argument, page 77. Well, if they want my money in this age of disintermediation, they'd better be concerned. I know what a cruise ship line committed to sustainability looks like. I was hired a couple of years ago to be a presenter for three weeks on the National Geographic Explorer a cruise ship owned and run by the Lindblad family of vessels, which have the highest standards of sustainability on the seas. In fact, I was brought on board the vessel as it traveled down the coast of Brazil through Uruguay to Argentina, precisely to give lectures on sustainability and lead groups of tourists to the Vale Encantado Favela on the hill overlooking the beaches of Rio, where my NGO, Solar Cities, built food waste and toilet waste biodigesters to provide clean fuel and keep sewage and waste from flowing into the coastal marine environment. The added value for high paying customers on that trip was that the vessel was using sustainable practices and the staff was extremely knowledgeable about every aspect of sustainability in all its dimensions, financial, social, and environmental. Even the seafood was sustainably harvested. But then Lindblad Expeditions with National Geographic is hardly your run of the mill tour operator. So what did I expect from this random phone call telling me I'd won a cruise to the Bahamas for answering a little robotic survey about green preferences? Weaver is quite clear when he says, conventional travel agencies, guidebooks, outbound tour operators, and cruise ships seem to have the lowest levels of engagement with the latter two, the outbound tour operators and cruise ships, these sectors having acquired some notoriety for their alleged unsustainable practices. Weaver reminds us how, quote, the hospitality sector has a relatively high involvement with sustainability and how airlines have always been intensively regulated and occupy a position closer to the hotels in this respect, end quote. He cites the sector-wide initiatives such as the CIWMPP, the TOI, and the IHE, all of which you should know for the quiz, which give room for optimism and singles out TUI, British Airways, and the Marriott chain as, quote, innovative corporate leaders who, with their high level of vertical as well as horizontal integration, can be extremely influential. American Airlines has assigned, for example, a thousand environmental coordinator positions to employees who've been given the responsibility of ensuring compliance with environmental regulations at its various stations. They have an EMIS, or Environmental Management Information System, to manage and monitor their practices, quote, first of waste reduction, then recycling or reuse, followed by treatment and finally disposal, end quote. Their metrics are promising. Enough recycling between 1992 and 2001 to save 51,000 trees, 19,300,000 liters of water, 6.6 .6 million kilowatt hours of electricity, and 10,600 cubic meters of landfill space. There are promising metrics from British Airways as well, with their reduction of domestic CO2 emissions to 16% below the 2000 baseline and replacement aircraft achieving ICAO highest noise standards. They even achieved a 61% reduction in fuel spills over the previous year, so they aren't contaminating our environments quite as much as they used to, if that's any consolation. And they collected money from passengers through the Change for Good program, which since 1994 has collected more than 15 million British pounds and used it to fund development programs in Nigeria and Zambia. 
not mentioned is whether these were sustainable development programs or not. It's easy to get cynical. In fact, since Weaver concludes in his summary on page 87 that most of the facilitating sectors of the tourism industry currently adhere to a mere veneer model of sustainability, one can get cynical indeed. He argues, quote, though progress is evident, it does not appear as if the engagement with sustainability has penetrated deeply into any of these sectors, despite the widespread institutionalization of sustainable tourism, both internally and externally. Measures taken even by the corporate leaders are generally those that are not overly expensive to implement. For example, informational brochures or signage. Help to lower costs, for example, energy use reduction and recycling. Foster brand visibility. Heighten distinctions with competitors. And invite positive consumer response. For example, through award sponsorship and participation in community projects. More disturbingly, the level of engagement beyond the corporate leaders appears tenuous at best. End quote. He says that, quote, tour operators reveal not just low effort or minimalist adherence to sustainability, but also high levels of unawareness and non-involvement. Barriers to pursuing sustainability include confusion over the meaning of sustainable tourism, lack of knowledge and support, a need to focus on the financial bottom line, and the lack of any concerted belief that consumers are actually demanding substantive change. Let me repeat that. The lack of any concerted belief that consumers are actually demanding substantive change. That's from page 88. But see, this last point is the one that gives me the most hope. When I got off the phone with the cruise ship tour package salesman, we both came away a little changed. I saw confirmation of Weaver's cynicism, but also some significant wiggle room for hope because the four salesmen I spoke to each left that hardball call more convinced than ever that consumers are actually demanding substantive change. They came in so confident that they had just the thing for me based on a conventional view of human desires and purchasing patterns and realized that I was serious about my commitment to sustainability and would only respond to substantive change. Since their sales pitch involves chatting the potential client up and trying to get a sense of where their weaknesses are, I hit them with the fact that I study sustainable tourism and that at one time I wrote for an alternative tourism guidebook. They had to stretch a bit to find a match between what they thought they could offer me and what would really make me part with my hard-earned money. And I'd like to think this encounter is something they will talk about tonight at the bar when they compare sales. And so I imagine that if all of you, if all of us studying sustainable tourism start helping tour operators believe that it is time to change the way they approach their industry because we're demanding it, the supply and demand curve will change rather rapidly. It says the Pogo cartoon from the last century said, we've met the enemy and he is us. If we don't speak up about our preferences when we're talking to people in the tourism world, then how would they know? What intimidates or discourages us from constantly engaging with the folks who make up the tourism industry and helping create the very real sense that we mean business for their business? Isn't it partially our fault that they don't have faith that learning about sustainability and making it real will improve their bottom line? In a capitalist economy, you can vote with your dollars, and the consumer is king. We want sustainable tourism. All we have to do is show them we mean it.